Hello, and thank you for having us this morning. We're happy to be here to present to you on behalf of the RCMP. The RCMP consists of units that look specifically at anti-fraud, anti-money laundering, federal security and cybercrime, and has analysts and policy professionals. We have also teamed up with a representative from FinTrack to help round out our understanding. Today we have with us Anna Fesk from the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre, Aaron Shane from the Financial Transactions and Reports Analysis Centre of Canada, FinTrack, Kelsey Fleming from the National Cyber Crime Coordination Centre, and myself, Victoria Young, from the Federal Serious and Organized Crime Financial Integrity Unit. Next slide, please. So today we're coming to you from Edmonton, Alberta. However, the RCMP is headquartered in Ottawa and operates across Canada on the unceded and unsurrendered territory, territory of Indigenous communities. We would like to acknowledge that due to the role played by the RCMP and its predecessors in implementing and enforcing colonial rule, today's RCMP has inherited a complex legacy. The RCMP is committed to building a renewed relationship and trust with the more than 600 Indigenous communities that we serve across Canada. Next slide, please. Digital currencies are rapidly proliferating across, outside of Canada's regulatory reach. Canadians rely on the government and law enforcement to keep their safety, security, and privacy at the forefront of their decisions and actions. The Canadian government must respond to existing tensions between the potential creation of a central bank digital currency and its uptake. We understand the potential value of a central bank digital currency system and the necessity for Canada to remain competitive economically and technologically on the global scale. While we are optimistic regarding the establishment of a safe and effective framework to implement CBDC, it is our job to consider and be prepared for the possibility of criminal investigations related to CBDC crime. The RCMP would like to see a CBDC system that is well regulated and helps to legitimize the digital currency market. Introduction of this kind of CBDC could help move users from untraceable cryptocurrencies into a market that is more easily regulated and tracked by government authorities. This way, anti-money laundering compliance and monitoring is much easier for companies and the RCMP themselves. A legitimized system will facilitate regulators in stamping out illegal activity and ensuring the system is safe and secure for all Canadians. Next slide, please. We will start by looking at why the RCMP has a vested interest in the implementation of a central bank digital currency. The Bank of Canada says the CBDC ecosystem will be a high value target once deployed. As digital and cryptocurrencies evolve, digital crime follows suit. A CBDC in Canada would be no different. According to the newly developed National Cyber Crime Coordination Unit, or NC3, Cyber fraud and fraud have increased 260% since 2014. This number is based on reported crimes, and the NC3 estimates that only about 5-10% to of these types of crimes are reported. When looking at economic loss, each year records are broken with 2022 seeing $531 million in losses, and if we assume that accounts for 10% of reported cases, this is a $5 billion problem. Even more troubling is that an estimated $46.7 billion was laundered in Canada in 2018. According to Public Safety Canada, money laundering is a serious crime that affects Canadians' safety, security, and quality of life. It disguises the source of money that comes from illegal means. Laundered funds feed other activities like corruption, fraud, human trafficking, and trade in drugs and firearms. It also poses a threat to the integrity and stability of the global financial system and the broader economy. Next slide, please. This is a complex and rapidly evolving problem, which the Government of Canada takes very seriously. Federal policing priorities highlight key target activities, including interference that threatens economic security, organized crime that crosses borders, and money laundering that involves moving criminal proceeds to, from, or through Canada. Investment from the Government of Canada has helped to create a network that works in partnership to address rapidly changing issues. Since 2019, hundreds of millions have been dedicated to strengthening anti-money laundering, <clears throat> divisional money laundering teams, and the creation of the National Cyber Crime Coordination Unit. Within this, key investment areas include modernization of anti-money laundering laws, 
strengthening of interagency cooperation and information sharing, and equipping law enforcement with tools and expertise to support investigations. The RCMP role is one of risk mitigation and criminal investigation, and we provide support needed to combat digital threats. Fortunately, in these ways, dedicated units and teams within the RCMP can be partners for the implementation of a CBDC in Canada. Next slide, please. CBDC development is a unique opportunity to combat the many costly consequences of cyber fraud and money laundering and draw users away from untraceable cryptocurrency markets. A successful CBDC will legitimize the digital currency market by providing the means for law enforcement to prevent, reduce, and track money laundering and funding for illegal activities. Careful designing and policy considerations will underpin public trust in CBDCs. This enables the government to navigate the tension between security and utility in design. To navigate this tension, we have identified three core policy objectives that a CBDC implementation plan would need to fulfill. The policy must provide security, the policy must protect the privacy of Canadians, and it must facilitate trust. Next slide, please. Now that we have identified our core design priorities, I'm going to walk us through the policy options we developed for your consideration today. In developing these options, we intentionally adopted a regulate-by-design approach. That is to say, each policy option was designed to explicitly and preemptively address the various regulatory practical challenges of introducing a CBDC. As we identified earlier, this is a foundational tension between security and utility in CBDC design. Our implementation options address this tension in different ways through crucial differences in organizational roles in the deployment of CBDCs. Next slide, please. Our first option is for the federal government to lead the rollout of the CBDC through existing Service Canada infrastructure. Under this proposal, Service Canada will create individuals' accounts to access the digital currency, and Service Canada will verify the identity of the account holder and assign account ID numbers. Currently, Service Canada already performs a great deal of the services necessary for identity verification. While this entails a slight expansion of Service Canada's mandate, the responsibilities are procedurally no different from the organization's regular operations. Our second option involves commercial banks leading the initial rollout of a CBDC. Banks would provide account creation and identity, identity verification services using pre-existing digital account creation infrastructure and identity verification procedures. In accordance with the regulatory requirements of the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions and the Financial, Co Financial Consumer Agency of Canada, these processes are already largely standardized between banks and across provincial and territorial jurisdictions. Finally, our third option is for digital currencies to be accessed through a physical object. For ease of access, commercial banks would be responsible for issuing these devices to surrounding communities. Next slide, please. Much like paper money, a device-linked digital currency would not require any identification procedures and could be used with near complete anonymity. For ease of use, CBDC devices would resemble credit cards and each would be programmed with a unique identification number, which would serve as the only identifying feature on the core transaction ledger. To ensure consistency and interoperability, the devices would be sourced from a single manufacturer and distributor through, on through an ongoing contract at the cost of the federal government. Next slide, please. Weighing these policy options against one another requires returning to our core design objectives, security, privacy, and trust. As such, we have developed this decision matrix to compare the options according to each objective. For security, government and bank-issued CBDC accounts perform fairly similarly. As each involves an identifiable account, restrictive transaction limits are not a necessary security measure. Similarly, both entail ID verification processes managed by highly regulated institutions. 
As such, built-in anti-money laundering protections used by Canadian banks and government would apply to CBDC accounts, facilitating seamless coordination between FinTrack, commercial banks, and the Anti-Fraud Centre. The object-linked design, however, struggles on both measures, and in compliance with prepaid product regulations, would require, would require a strict transaction limit of $500 to avoid triggering FinTrack reporting. For privacy, all options provide anonymity at the point of purchase. Beyond the point of purchase, the, ident the account identification numbers issued by Banks or Service Canada would protect against data sharing through existing regulatory frameworks. Turning now to our last design objective, building and maintaining trust, only bank-issued CBDC accounts leverage pre-existing trust relationships for monitoring purposes. While the device-linked approach doesn't present new challenges to the trust relationship, it provides no governmental oversight and therefore requires highly restrictive security measures. Accounts managed and created by Service Canada, alternatively, introduce a new and problematic level of governmental oversight. This will likely strain the trust relationship and further lead to decreased uptake of the CBDC. From this decision-making matrix, we can see a general picture begin to emerge of which implementation option most successfully meets the design objectives we have laid out. Next slide, please. Introducing a CBDC will almost certainly list questions regarding information gathering, storage, sharing with the third parties, and with law enforcement. Privacy is the core value to many Canadians, and its significance cannot be overstated. At the same time, designing a CBDC presents a unique window of opportunity for Canada to prevent reduce and track illegal activity by monitoring users out of untraceable cryptocurrency markets and into a digital currency ecosystem that can be more easily regulated and tracked. Concerns related to security, privacy, and trust are why we are ultimately recommended CBDC implementations through bank-issued accounts. Through this design, users retain the level of anonymity from government oversight that they are used to having in cash transactions. Point of purchase and pledge anonymity address some of the concerns around data sharing by preventing transacting parties such as vendors from building consumer profiles based on purchasing habits and preventing the sale and distribution of data to third parties. At the same time, the bank managed approach fosters trust between Canadians and their governments. The potential for government monitoring and appropriate data sharing with the law enforcement is the key concern for policymakers and citizens alike. CBDC accounts verified by commercial banks leverage the existing trusted relationship between people and their commercial banks. These banks, rather than the government or the Bank of Canada, will manage identify verification and will follow pre-existing standards for information sharing with the law enforcement. Next slide, please. To successfully implement the CBDC in Canada, three main stakeholders might be involved. Civil society, private sector, and cross-jurisdictional partners. For Canadian civil society, rising awareness and providing education is the key to successful implementation. Through RCMP partnership with school divisions, enable discussion with students and school staff on CBDC, money laundering, frauds, threats on the internet, including classroom interaction and problem-solving activities. Furthermore, the involvement of a small medium enterprise government to share general and targeted information with private sector and government employees on the most significant illicit finance risk within their specific sectors, creating actions plans for educating and continuous training of cybersecurity skilled workforce. While Enhancing media literacy by providing free learning websites, educational YouTube channels is critical to implementing monitoring and crisis management systems. Interprovincial and cross jurisdictional collaboration is crucial by strengthening the RCMP's provincial money laundering teams by creating focus workshops, meetings, and events to share information, knowledge, best practices, and data sharing. Support technological innovation 
innovation has a main focus on examining the effectiveness and efficiency of monitoring system to detect and combat the money laundering risks and to ensure adoption of this technology is fit for all new challenges. Next slide, please. From a law enforcement perspective, the potential for money laundering is one of the most obvious risks of implementing digital currency. Money laundering and its associated costs are, unfortunately, an ever-present reality in Canada. However, adopting a regulate-by-design approach to policy implementation, the government ensures digital currency is subject to all existing anti-money laundering and suspicious transaction reporting regulations. Public distrust of both digital currency and the government is another hurdle. For many, building on pre-existing relationships with trusted banking institutions will ease concerns regarding government monitoring. Ensuring that RCMP recruitment and training are a priority can help increase public faith that the RCMP has the capacity to carry out effective investigations where criminals are found and held responsible. Barriers can reduce ability to share information effectively and lead to problematic information gaps. Such barriers include agency ego, technological incompatibility, and privacy legislation. The newly established NC3 was designed to bring multiple organizations to one table and works with partners internationally to bridge the gaps and provide investigative advice and guidance to Canadian police and produce actionable cybercrime intelligence. While public ignorance is certainly a challenge to implementing CBDCs, RCMP community policing already helps to educate the public at various levels through K-12 school programming and senior citizen programs and campaigns. Increasing CBDC literacy can be integrated within these existing programs. In addition to online learning, physical handbooks, guides, and staff are available at detachments across Canada. The last challenge we want to draw your attention to is the lack of reporting of cyber fraud at only about 5 to 10 percent. The National Cybercrime and Fraud Reporting System is currently in the piloting phase to make reporting easier. Reporting can increase information that can then be analyzed to increase organizational capabilities. This can also help with evaluation of implementation and track occurrences that relate to CBDC. Next slide, please. As a leader in CBDC design, Canada can shape the landscape of digital currency to best meet the needs of Canadians. When it comes to their money, the concerns of Canadians must come first. Canadians deserve a system that is secure, private, and trustworthy. Through thoughtful design and continued cooperation with national and international partners, Canada can provide options to consumers and businesses and legitimize the digital currency landscape. This approach leverages existing partnerships between the public service, the RCMP, and our national and international partners. Next slide, please. Thank you so much for your time today on this matter, and we're now open for questions. Thank you so much. On behalf of my colleagues on the panel, uh, I'd just like to, to go forward and say this is a very interesting presentation because Unfortunately, money and crime and security are all linked and uh, moving forward with something like this without a security perspective uh, is something that simply would be irresponsible for the government. I want to start off with a quick question before I turn to my colleagues. You make an intriguing uh, argument that um, Bitcoin is is out there already, which is something that that maybe we haven't heard enough about uh, in our other presentations. But I, I want to ask, do you see this initiative as a counter to Bitcoin or do you see it as a counter to cash or do you see it as a counter to the the current financial system? Sure. So first off, thank you for your question. Um, we see this system as a way to bring in users from unregulated cryptocurrency markets. That may include Bitcoin, Ethereum, private coins, and other, other cryptocurrency markets. At this time, we do recognize, though, that some, some level of the market that is committed to remaining free of government oversight, will free from government oversight, will likely stay in those unregulated markets. However, 
by moving the majority of the cryptocurrency digital currency using population into a regulated and traceable program um, that Canada has developed, we can stamp out cybercrime and more easily track, trace, and reduce cybercrime to increase security and safety for Canadians. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn to my colleague Shirley to, to ask a question or two. Sure, thanks so much. Um, so my question is, um, given the importance of remaining competitive just with respect to international trade and given all the risks that you've highlighted here today, um, when do you see the best time for Canada to kind of move forward with something like this um, relative to other countries just to mitigate some of the risks that you've actually highlighted? Sure, thank you, Shirley. So as we as we discussed throughout, we are the RCMP has a vested interest in implementing and deploying a Canadian made CBDC, which we can regulate by design. I'll pass it over to Kelsey to speak on timing for law enforcement. Sure, I think our priority concern would be um, we have this newly established National Cybercrime Coordination Center, which isn't fully operational yet, won't be until next year. So ideally, in a perfect world, we'd like to see a rollout of CBDC um, with around the same timing or shortly after that NC3 is fully established, just so that we have that fully operational and can then um, face any issues that arise um, just from a more firmed up standpoint. So that would be kind of our, our ideal. The NC3 is built uh, with the understanding and connections built right in to communicate with those international uh, other teams from uh, the United States all over the world. Um, JCAT also has about 18 countries that all are able to sit at the same table and uh, come at things from that international perspective. Thank you. Ron, can I ask you to chime in from uh, the perspective of the Bank of Canada on the security issue that's been put before us? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, a great presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, so certainly if we can uh, get people to move out of unregu unregulated crypto into a, a CBDC, you have more transactions going through a, a, a regulated uh, uh, mechanism with with the existing controls for fraud <clears throat> and money laundering, pardon me. Uh, in thinking about the uh, security by design, did you see, uh, what kind of opportunities did you see to, to uh, improve upon the level of, uh, uh, of oversight uh, and monitoring of transactions beyond what uh, is being done today to, to further reduce uh, money laundering and fraud that's occur cyber fraud that's occurring within the, the Canadian economy. Sure, I'd be happy to take that question. So as we discussed, we see CBDC design and impl implementation as a window of opportunity. Through a regulate, regulation by design approach, we can address challenges as they come and we can preemptively mitigate some challenges related to security. As such, opportunities may arise in relation to, in relation to digital security of individual wallets and individual access. So challenges may arise in relation to smart contracts. All of those challenges can be mitigated through carefully considered and well thought out public policy regarding CBDC design. At this time, at this time, the challenges that are ahead are unknown. As with any technology, thing, we don't know exactly what will happen. However, we can anticipate challenges to the best of our ability and try to design our CBDC program to mitigate those challenges and provide additional support and digital infrastructure for law enforcement to rely upon in reducing, preventing, tracking, and tracing security threats. I would, I would just like to add, sorry, tack on to the end of that, really the education and reporting piece. If we can improve our reporting numbers, then as law enforcement, that really gives us a bigger um, greater understanding of what exactly we're dealing with and can lead to um, better intelligence that allows us to act um, act more informed going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Alan, do you have any questions? Oh, sorry, I was actually not on mute. I apologize. Um, my question uh, was around, you talked about um, uh, the RCMP policing units uh, potentially 
being involved in addressing public ignorance, I think is the language that you used. Um, do you think, how, how well do you think um, the RCMP members um, would understand this in a way to kind of make it um, palatable? I know um, there are some challenges uh, in terms of kind of regular members understanding of the kind of money laundering side, um, the more um, uh, IT related and other things um, uh, within the RCMP. So uh, I guess I'm wondering, is that a realistic uh, way to, to address public ignorance? Thank you. Understanding within the RCMP is a core concern for us. And I'd like to pass this off to Kelsey and Anna. Sure. So I can uh, tackle a little bit of that. Um, RCMP internally has always had some concerns just regarding recruitment and internal training. These types of crimes evolve so quickly. It's really key for us to make sure that we have staff that are trained and up to date on ways to combat that and understanding really what we're working with. The community policing aspect allows the RCMP to have dedicated staff within each detachment that are really focused on creating and maintaining those interactions with, um, with the public, be it school children, um, town halls, senior citizens, wherever that may be. So there really is staff dedicated to those roles. So yes, there would be some, um, some of us ensuring that they have that education, but at least the roles are, are already integrated within the detachments. Um, Anna, did you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to highlight uh, interprovincial collaboration between different uh, money laundering teams. It was already uh, established, the richest four of them. However, it's the project that they had started. And so uh, we can see that this collaboration uh, between provinces will enhance the abilities of these teams. Thank you. Randall, can I invite you to ask a question? Uh, yes, thank you very much. That was a very interesting um, uh, presentation. Uh, I really have two questions. One is about, uh, you know, the international context and the FATF, et cetera, and, and how you might think uh, Canada moving towards, towards your option would actually um, add to, you know, the international efforts to, to uh, you know, to tackle uh, money laundering and maybe terrorism finance. Uh, but I, my more kind of pressing question, actually, um, you don't have to answer the first one. My more pressing one is, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure from your presentation how uh, uh, a CBDC issued by, monitored by a stepped up national regulatory uh, infrastructure will actually tackle um, money laundering and, and, and the different and nefarious purposes to which money is put because presumably criminal organizations, et cetera, will actually use these new currencies, this new currency. They will continue to use existing arrangements because we're not phasing out uh, um, uh, of, of currency. So uh, this is one thing I would like to push you on. What What is the value added of going down that route? Um, and I appreciate that that's your major concern, but uh, it, it wasn't clear to me how how this could be accomplished. Sure, if I can offer a two-pronged response to your question. I think first we want to recognize that you are absolutely right. There are committed criminal organizations and criminal networks that will remain on the untraceable and untrackable cryptocurrency market. That is something that we at this point cannot change. It would be up to parliament to potentially address legal mechanisms to ban those markets, whether or not they choose to do so. However, at the same time, we believe that we can legitimize a large portion of the market. There is a great deal of cyber fraud that goes on within cryptocurrencies. For criminal networks, this is obviously a bonus that it is untraceable. However, for the many Canadians who are being defrauded out of their money through investment fraud, which increasingly involves digital currencies, moving over to a legitimized tra trackable market would protect those Canadians and their money. Additionally, for the second prong of my response, I we'd like to put forth that 
we'd like to put forth that law enforcement has a complex role in this in this design-based aspect. As such, we would need to have a flexible approach going forward. Threats and challenges will emerge in real time as a CBDC is implemented. And that is why, as Kelsey mentioned, we believe it's important that Canada leads the pack in developing a CBDC such that we can have we can have input into the design procedure, but furthermore, coordinates that timing of implementation with law enforcement to ensure that our partnerships and our collaboration relationships with international and cross-jurisdictional partners are fully cemented so that we can track, trace, and prevent these crimes. Once again, on behalf of my fellow panelists, I would like to thank you for coming uh, to give this presentation. It's given us a lot to think about in terms of security, in terms of privacy, and in terms of criminality, which is uh, your core function at the RCMP. So all our very best, and thank you so much for spending time with us this morning.